it's important to oh and now we're recording um, we're also going to be recording this evening's this evening session um so that is terrific um hang on let me acknowledge uh and I, I think uh, it's been at the center of those passionate conversations um, in no small part because it's important to so many Oregonians for so many different and often competing reasons. So our challenge um, at the Department of State Lands has really been finding a future for the Elliott that reflects all those diverse perspectives and priorities. Um, from those passionate conversations, a path forward emerged. Um, when first in 2017, the state land board voted to keep voted to keep the Elliott public um, and then with their vision for the forest that reflects many different values that people hold um, those that that vision reflects their desire for a public forest that has completed its contribution to funding schools, but continues to contribute to conservation, recreation, education, Oregon economies and much more. Um, the land board further directed us down the path that we're on um, to collaboratively create a research forest with OSU. So tonight, um, we're going to hear updates on key pieces of that work, including brief updates on the forest management planning process and the forest habitat conservation plan. Um, we've then got a presentation for you on the legislation that's needed to keep the forest public by establishing an independent public entity to oversee the forest. Um, we've been working with the Elliott Advisory Committee, talking with stakeholders, talking with the public on that, and have identified some key elements of, of what we think legislation should include, um, and we'll be talking more about that. So after each of those updates, there'll be time for questions or thoughts. Um, I'm going to ask you all to use the share hand, the, the raise hand feature, which is under reactions if you click there. If you're joining us on the phone, it doesn't look like anybody is. If anybody happens to be on the phone, if you have to drop off, it's star nine to raise your hand. Um, and with that, I think we can just go ahead and get started. Does anybody have any questions immediately about uh, why it is we're here and what it is we'll be doing tonight. Great, then my work is done and I'm gonna hand it over to Tom and Shannon to provide the first update. Great, thank you, Ollie. Um, I'll, I'll be brief and turn it over to Shannon to talk about the forest management planning process and, and uh, updates on that. I'll just say that, you know, um, uh, OSU has, has been engaged in this and continues to be engaged in this issue for um, multiple reasons. Number one, we, we fully believe in the, the idea behind the forest being remaining a public um, forest with full access and, and, um, and meeting those, uh, that commitment while running a research forest. We are we recognize because of the challenges that we face looking forward, uh, the challenges created by climate change, challenges created by species extirpation, challenges created by continuing population growth and, and consumer demand for resources that we have to learn to achieve our, our resource needs with minimal impact on the environment and the uh, the Elliott State Research Forest creates this incredible opportunity to work on these very issues of how do we meet those resource demands sustainably? How do we meet those uh, timber resource demands while retaining, um, you know, the, the wood resource demands while retaining healthy, uh, function, fully functioning ecosystems and species uh, composition? And while providing access to recreation and and um, uh, and outstanding aesthetics, and and so we're wholly committed to that, and we're um, excited about the prospect of it. And the um, uh, this has brought us through the uh, research planning process to. Uh, uh, bring us to next the forest management planning process. And um, I'll uh, turn it over to Shannon to take it from there. And we'll, we're just gonna keep this very brief and high level 
so that there's plenty of time for uh, discussion and questions. So Shannon. Great, thank you, Tom. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you can see that. Okay. Um, so as Tom said, I, I'm going to give a, a high level overview of where we are with the forest management planning process, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, my name is Shannon Murray. I'm the program director for the Elliott State Research Forest. I'm based out of Oregon State University College of Forestry. And uh, just to give an overview of, of where we've come from and where we are now, um, this is a copy of the Elliott State Research Forest proposal. Um, and there's a, a screenshot of the website here where you can find this proposal. Um, if you have not already seen it, there's a, a link there as well. And so um, we are working on developing the Elliott State Research Forest Management Plan, which will document what the research forest will achieve, how it will achieve it, and how decisions will be made on the forest. And so the plan is based on this research proposal, the vision, guidelines, and policies that are established in this plan, um, as well as um, the uh, information from the Oregon Forest Practices Rules, the uh, Habitat Conservation Plan, which you'll also hear more about tonight, and other applicable federal and state laws. And so this is really one of the foundational and guiding documents that we're using in our planning process for the research uh, management plan. Um, to give a, a very high level snapshot of the research platform and the experimental design um, that, that this is based on, um, in this research plan, we have outlined um, with extensive consultation from uh, stakeholders, from the public, and from researchers from multiple institutions, um, this idea of a triad experimental design. And so uh, you can see um, in this map here, which might be a little small on your screen, so I apologize. I encourage you to go to the research proposal to see a bigger version. But you can see a map here of the Elliott um, broken down into a couple of different areas. You have this um, conservation research uh, watershed here, uh, a conservation reserve watershed that's uh, about 41% of the Elliott, um, as well as uh, this MRW, this management uh, uh, research watershed area. And so this area is um, a mix of several different treatment allocations, um, ranging from a reserve with intensive all the way to an extensive or ecological forestry. And that just re refers to the types of treatments um, and, and harvest uh, designs to support those treatments that, uh, that would be implemented on the forest. And so approximately 67% of the forest is in reserves in between this dark green area, um, the, uh, the light green uh, reserve with intensive areas, and then uh, the riparian conservation areas across the entire forest. About 17% is in intensive and about 16% in extensive. So about two thirds of the forest is fully in reserve. Now we're at the stage where we're working on this forest management plan to talk about um, how we will achieve management of the forest and these goals. And so the process for this development is kind of like a layer cake where our ultimate goal is to, um, to develop this forest management plan that fully integrates the why, how, the goals and measurable objectives of this research forest. And so if we start uh, down here at the bottom of the, the layer cake, we have um, this process of collecting information and data. And that includes gathering existing data, um, as well as developing a new database management system for the Elliott that's mirrored on um, the H.J. Andrews public facing database. And so it, um, what we are working on right now is modeled on the H.J. Andrews. And so we are working on gathering this existing data in our new database management system, as well as working on additional needs um, in order to complete this forest management process. We have uh, a series of uh, modeling simulations that we're also working on at the landscape scale that use this data input 
um, to give us uh, an idea of what's happening at the stand scale as well as the landscape scale and to really tailor um, the initial information that was in that research proposal and uh, and um, refine it for the stage of the management planning process. And then all of this data and modeling is really leading into a landscape wide analysis, looking at um, the different scenarios um, that our research and management would lead to, um, looking at decision making and where we want to put our energies in this management plan and in the creation of this research forest so that we're putting it on the trajectory um, to fully support the research and educational miss mission of the forest. And then layered on top of this, of course, is the monitoring plan. Um, research monitoring is, is key to the vision for this forest as well as the adaptive management principles. So that would include looking at um, the implementation of the management that's outlined in this plan um, over the, the initial few years, and then um, really adapting over time as we continue to learn more and collect more data. And so if you think of this, all the steps of that layer cake, if you break it down, this is a, a draft um, look at our timeline. And I know that you aren't able to see all of these details. Um, what I wanted to, uh, to what I want you to take away from this slide is the fact that um, we have multiple processes um, that are the steps of that layer cake happening at the same time. And so that first step, that data collection step is this blue line down here. Um, that's been ongoing. And for this period, we're looking at October through uh, the completion of the plan that's running uh, the entire time. Layered on top of that, um, we have the modeling, um, the landscape analysis and experimental design. And then of course, fully integrating uh, with the habitat conservation plan, which we'll um, hear more about tonight as well. And so um, across each of these months, we have uh, multiple processes going at the same time. The information from each step really feeds into the next step. And so um, with this process, we're looking forward to continuing public engagement, um, to gaining input from a variety of partners and stakeholders, um, as well as the uh, research and science working groups that um, are coming together on this management plan. And with that, um, I will uh, turn it back over and I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to that, that point. Thanks, Shannon. Um, does anybody have any questions for, for Tom um, or Shannon? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised. I do wanna note um, one that we've had a couple more folks from OSU join us, Katie Kavanaugh. And I think, did I see Anna? Um, Anna, who I'm going, I'm going, Anna, yeah, Anna, yeah. Anna Magnuson um, from the OSU teams here as well. So just noting, noting that so everybody knows um, who on the team we've got in the room. And I'm also going to note that my toddler came home. So bringing with her joy, joy and noise. So if you hear sounds, um, at my house, that's what they are. I am now gonna turn it over to Jeff, who is both um, going to give a quick update on the Habitat Conservation Plan, um, and then move into a presentation about the Elliott State Research Forest legislation. So Jeff, take it away. Okay, and then we can, I think all of us are available for questions afterwards. I see that there's a hand up from Janae Moore right now. So maybe we should take that one first. Yep, Janae, go right ahead. Hi, thank you. Yeah, my question's about um, the research proposal. So maybe now is the time. I had a um, DSL employee tell me that OSU will be practicing ecoforestry on the Elliott, but in the extensive harvest units. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but that's actually not true. The treatments don't meet the definition of ecoforestry. Um, according to places like the Ecoforestry Institute, International Ecoforestry Foundation, and places like Wildwood Forest and Mountain Homestead, because um, extensive treatments will be logged at 20 to 80 percent, but in ecoforestry, only one percent of a given area is logged every year, or sometimes five percent every five years. Um, and it's a truly selective manner. There's no patches of disturbed understory, and actually, only the weakest trees are cut. Um, 
and this type of forestry can produce more board feet quicker than clear cutting. Um, in ecoforestry, the oldest and healthiest trees are always retained because they have the most connections to other trees and um, so they can seed out. So there's no need to replant, spray herbicides or burn flash. Um, there's no need to use fertilizers because nutrient cycling is controlled by the tree feeding exudates to the surrounding microbial community. Um, not, not only limited to mycorrhizal fungi, but all of the microbes that the trees nurture around them. Um, and the nitrogen fertilizer actually stops mycorrhizal relationships from forming um, and results in a nutrient deficient, water starved, fire prone landscape. Um, and then I'll wrap up really quick, but um, the soil fungi are actually what's responsible for creating soil structure. They create the uh, macro aggregates that allow the soil to infiltrate and retain water as well as oxygen. And, um, you know, you need the soil to stay oxygenated because all pathogens, all disease pathogens are anaerobic. Um, so you really wanna prevent those. Um, and so typical logging practices are killing the soil fungi and um, this is why we're seeing stream flow deficits and uh, fires are more severe on timberland. Um, and then also a lot of people don't understand fungi are crucial for fighting climate change. They sequester massive amounts of carbon. And when the fungi are wiped out by management, the landscape because, becomes bacteria dominated and bacteria produce massive amounts of CO2 because bacteria exhale 80% of the carbon they ingest whereas uh, fungi are continually armoring their hyphae with highly stable forms of carbon like mannids and chitons. And fungi also um, create stable forms of soil organic matter like fulvic and humic acids. So um, I just feel like if this is gonna be a world-class research force, you really need to incorporate some of this research um, into soil fungi and um, truly researching ecoforestry, not just calling it ecoforestry. So, um, and it's actually really easy to do. I'm a student at the Soil Food Web School that was started by Dr. Elaine Ingham, form formerly of OSU. And it's actually amazingly easy to learn how to do these rapid biological assessments in the field. And I'm just bringing this up because I haven't seen anything about soil fungi in the um, research proposal, even though there's so much research. Um, there's uh, Dr. David Johnson in um, University of New Mexico, and there's a Swedish study showing using um, you know, radioactive isotopes with carbon to show where the carbon's going. And it's 50 to 70% of the carbon is going into the soil fungi, but that's being completely ignored by everyone that's supposed to be managing for climate change. And so I would just ask that you try to incorporate some of these, um, these things that are pretty well known <laughs> at this point, but you know, land grant universities have been ignoring them but for the most part. So, thank you. Thanks, Janae. Um, any follow-up or thoughts from the team? Yeah, I, I'll I'll start off and just say thanks, Janae. I I mean I really appreciate your comments. I I you know we are I whether it shows in the research proposal or or not from you know uh, trying to incorporate all the research that's going to happen on the Elliott. It's an 82,000 acre you know, research opportunity and incorporated in that, in addition to the, um, the what we have called uh, alternative or extensive forest management uh, strategies, there are um, uh, within the reserves where there are plant, currently plantations, those, treat, uh, those plantations will receive treatments that are focused on restoring the natural function and structure that had existed prior to uh, the uh, management on the Elliott. And those create great opportunities to study exactly what you're talking about. We have uh, a number of microbiologists on campus at OSU, uh, and we have individuals that have worked on the microbiology of the um, uh, of forest ecosystems from OSU and from the College of Forestry, both you know in uh, at the HJ Andrews and other locales. And uh, this site creates a number of opportunities 
on that front to, to dig into the microbiology of soils. The, um, some of the statements that you made, I would, you know, would like to talk to you more about in detail. I am actually a soil microbiologist by training. And, um, and some of the, the um, thoughts about the stability of chitin in soil ecosystems are a bit misleading. It is, uh, chitin is, as you, as you know, is a, a polymer of an amino sugar that is actually readily broken down by the microbial community. And it is more stable than other amino compounds, but it is indeed a, a cycled compound. And we just want to be fully factual about these things and learn uh, and learn through um, uh, syst uh, systematic and systems-based research the best practices possible that achieve these um, resource objectives while meeting uh, whole system biological objectives as well. And the below ground will absolutely be a very significant component of that. And um, anyhow, Janae, I, I would, would appreciate the opportunity to talk with you privately. Your work sounds really interesting and, and uh, would like to follow up at some point. So thanks. Thank you, Tom. Um, all right, now we are gonna go back to Jeff, seeing no additional hands. Back over to Jeff. Okay, so um, I'll just give a, a, a one minute um, update on the Habitat Conservation Plan process um, since we had several public information sessions on that. but. Um, the, the administrative draft was submitted by the state to NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on October 8th. So we have uh, a fully completed draft document that I um, believe Ali has posted on the DSL website and available for the public um, to look at anytime um, you would like. Um, that is currently being reviewed by the federal agencies to determine if that draft is what they call NEPA ready, which means that it's not um, necessarily the final, um, the final version of the, of the uh, uh, habitat conservation plan and what they would want to see in the plan, but rather is um, close enough that they can begin to um, start the scoping process for what the environmental impact statement under um, the NEPA process would require. So um, I suspect we will hear something from the federal agencies um, early in the next year around um, their anticipated timing for running a public comment period on the alternatives analysis that they'll conduct looking at the administrative draft we've put on the table um, and comparing that to different alternatives that are required in the NEPA process. So that'll really be the next step. Um, that will have that will involve the opportunity for public review and comment, but it'll be being run by US Fish and Wildlife Service um, and, and it'll be a federal public comment process. That doesn't mean that um, DSL, we're not, you know, we're, we're happy to talk to folks about the Habitat Conservation Plan, if you're doing a full review of it and you've got some questions, um, I'm pretty easy, my email is pretty easy to find and I'll put it on the, on the chat box here. Um, but the, we will also post on the DSL website any notices that come out from the federal government uh, related to the HCP. So that's really what's happening on that process. Um, if there's any questions, um, oh, I've got somebody in the chat room that's asking me to define NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, and it requires um, any before a final agency action from a federal agency occurs that they um, conduct an analysis of alternative alternatives to the proposed action. Um, so they look at um, a, a suite of alternatives. Um, that um, and, and compare that to the proposed action before the federal agency reaches a final determination. So they do that with habitat conservation plans as well. Um, and so the public scoping process will be 
what is a viable range of alternatives um, first, and then um, a second round of public comment will be on the substantive provisions in the HCP that is before the agency for, for a decision. Okay. Absent any other questions, um, I'll go to the um, pending development of the legislative concept for enabling legislation. Um, I'm going to, uh, assuming that some of you have not been tracking or, um, per, or watching the working group meetings, um, I've consolidated some of what the advisory committee has been working on for the last month and a half uh, around uh, the development of a legislative concept that would be the basis for a bill being drafted. Um, but before we get to that, the stepping back, um, we are not developing the bill language in the process. What we're doing is working with a subgroup of the advisory committee to frame kind of some of the real important, here I've got to admit somebody, some of the real important provisions that would be in a bill that ultimately will be introduced. Um, <clears throat> that we're relying on members of the DSL Elliott Advisory Committee that's been in place since 2019. And there's a subgroup that um, meets those meetings are open to the public they're posted when they happen they were happening every friday afternoon for a number of weeks but we um, got to the point where we had a concept that we submitted to legislative council to begin the bill drafting process so we've taken a a bit of a breather um, but i suspect that the next meeting of that working group will not happen this week, um, but quite likely will happen at the end of next week, although we haven't got a meeting scheduled yet. But um, if you're tracking the process closely, you're going to want to plug in on the website and, um, and look, for, um, look for notice of that meeting. Um, we also have been having, for members of the public, um, an opportunity just to drop in and ask questions about the legislative development process, and those have been happening on Tuesdays at 4 o'clock. We're taking a breather from those as well right now because the, the working group hasn't been working, um, hasn't been meeting, but um, we will also begin to notice those, but there won't be a, a um, Tuesday drop-in period next Tuesday either because the working group isn't meeting this week. So with that, um, let me share my screen and Allie, can you see that? Yep, I can. You'll be my tester. Okay, great. Perfect. So um, this is just a, an outline of key process pieces for those of you, that, again, that are tracking. Um, we did submit a bill request to Legislative Council based on the work of the working group. And um, we'll, we expect to have some draft language back to us sometime by January. Um, and there may be an opportunity to turn that around again. But um, That'll be discussed in a working group meeting those that, that's noticed and, and open to the public. There is a full advisory committee meeting scheduled for the 15th of December, and there'll be a report out on the bill draft progress there um, as well. And actually, I think we're also discussing some of the financial analysis that the university has been doing for the long-term operation of the forest. Um, and there'll be a couple of other agenda items. And I assume that that agenda will be posted on the website late, uh, uh, probably a week ahead of time, seven days usually. So you can look for that next week. Um, we expect to have a final bill draft submitted um, uh, by the 14th of January. That's the legislative draft um, deadline um, for the February 2022 session. And then we'll have another advisor, full advisory committee meeting that week to talk about the, the, the bill draft that's been introduced in, in detail there as well and then the legislative session starts in February. Um, <clears throat> the decision was made to pursue legislation in the February 2022 session um, because we really arrived at a point where um, there were enough threads of work completed and enough um, key ones that were waiting that um, we understood that we really needed to um, begin to establish what would be the structure of the vessel that would contain the, the governance structure for the Elliott State Research Forest. So um, there are some key elements of that legislation, and these are the ones I'm going to talk about tonight. And there's obviously going to be more in the bill 
when it's drafted than what's uh, in this outline. But the key elements really are how do we establish an independent public entity and create a mission that is understandable and, endure, and endures over time and serves the purposes that, um, the, that led OSU to be interested in the first place and the land board to set us on this pathway in 2018. Um, and then establishing oversight responsibilities and clearly articulating the roles for a board of directors and executive director and there will be some continued connection to the state land board and that's also set out in the in the current legislative concept draft and then um, there are some provisions that have been worked through by the working group already around public accountability there are a few more um, items that'll that'll be in the legislation but this is what the working group has worked on so far so in terms of how the Elliot will um, exist um, after it is decoupled from the common school fund. Um, it will continue to be owned by the state of Oregon, um, but the decision has been made to, as, um, in the, to pursue a legislative package that will create an independent public entity that'll be responsible for overseeing the forest going forward. Um, that um, as opposed to having the Elliott put in the purview of an existing state agency or in fully under the control and ownership and authority of Oregon State University. Those, those two options um, have been discussed at length and set aside. And at this point, we're on a pathway to have the legislation create an, uh, a new, and you could call it a public body, you could call it a public agency, you could call it a, 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 an authority, a public authority, but it will be um, it will be a public entity that is created in legislation and the, the forest will continue to be owned by the state and will be a publicly owned forest. Um, the legislation, because we're creating a new public entity, we have to identify um, who will oversee that entity and be responsible for the management, uh, ongoing management over time um, and fiscal and all the other things that come along with managing an 83,000 acre forest. A lot of discussion has been happening between Oregon State University and DSL and the working group um, advisory committee stakeholders. And um, I'll talk in detail about it, but the current trajectory is that there will be an appointed board of directors that will oversee and be responsible for the entity. And there are um, a lot of built in connections and interconnections with Oregon State University having a very active role expected in the management of the forest to ensure the research mission is, is implemented the way it needs to be implemented to preserve the integrity of the research that is the whole reason we're in this process. Um, <clears throat> so it'll be an independent entity, but we're also trying to make sure that in establishing it, it doesn't have to stand alone. It can ask for and, and, and receive services from other agencies. Um, and that could include budgeting human resources, the Department of Justice providing legal counsel to the agency, to the, to the authority and the entity, those kind of things. So the legislation will handle all of that. Really the, the two parts of tonight in this slide deck that I, I just have taken intact out of the work of the advisory body um, or the advisory committee is this overarching mission statement, which was crafted by the members of the stakeholder committee and OSU um, principally, um, it was felt like there should be this an overarching statement that would characterize the essence of why this forest is being created and the, and the entity established to, to run it. So I'll let you um, take a look at that for a minute and then um, we'll move on. Um, and we can come back to that if you've got questions or comments around this overarching mission statement, we'll put it back up in a few minutes. Okay, so the next, uh, along with this overarching mission statement, oops, um, the working group created these 11 bullets that you see in front of you that establish, um, are called statements of purpose in the legislation. And it's, and it's a, um, a common thing in a piece of legislation to not only have an overarching mission statement, but to articulate very precise and clear reasons why the entity is being established and, the, and what's the purpose of this entity. 
And so um, these 11 statements of purpose um, have um, received a lot of work and, and crafting by um, the different interests that are represented on the, on the advisory committee and with OSU's help. Um, I don't think I'm gonna go through them individually. Um, I really don't think you wanna hear me read them off, but um, I think if you go through that list quickly, you'll see that there's um, a strong emphasis around um, it being publicly owned, that there's gonna be more than um, just um, research happening on the forest, that there are other purposes that the forest is being created that need to be managed in a way that's compatible with the research. Um, and that um, there's some real um, focus on um, forest health and in a, in a number of different contexts and partnerships um, and, and, um, and the financial piece was certainly not left off uh, of this list of statements of purpose as well. We'll come back to that if folks want to in discussion and questions. Um, so in terms of oversight, Again, I'm, I'm just gonna give you the broad strokes of this and you can look at the, the sub bullets while I'm doing that. But um, a board of directors is going to ultimately be responsible for the operation of fiscal integrity of the, LA, of, the, of the new entity and ensuring that it meets the mission objectives and purpose of, of establishing the forest in the first place. Um, they'll be responsible for employing an executive director um, but that's going to be done in some very close collaboration with OSU that has been discussed extensively, some of which may be in the legislation and some which may be established in, uh, in some working operational principles of the board um, and done in collaboration with OSU. Um, there is a requirement that they meet in public um, and they um, have very specific obligations to approve um, different um, key components of managing the forest, budgets, operation um, plans, recreation plans, um, any amendments to the HCP or easements or encumbrances put on the forest, that kind of thing. Um, I think generally, if I were to characterize it, and I think Tom DeLuca will probably um, weigh in here, I'll give you an opportunity in a second, Tom. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to be clear that the board isn't going to be the day-to-day -day operational kind of folks. They're going to sit, they're going to be responsible for things, but they're going to, they're going to set their trajectory in collaboration with OSU. And then the expectation is that OSU really will be the entity on the, uh, on the ground doing the day-to-day -day operation. And I think you'll see that reflected in the, um, in the, um, the oversight and the, of the, the description here of the executive director. Tom, do you want to weigh in and give your perspective on this part of the conversation that's happened with the advisory committee? Yeah, no, I, I think you've done a really good job of capturing it, Jeff, that, you know, the, the advisory committee recognizes the, the need to, for OSU to have the uh, flexibility to manage day to day but also recognizes the need for those checks and balances to make sure that um, we're meeting the expectations and the obligations of uh, the agreed to management plan and, um, and all of the, you know, meeting all the, uh, the regulations associated with the, the um, management of the forest. So I, uh, I think that, um, the advisory board deliberated quite a bit on uh, what that looks like. And I think that um, they came up with a, a pretty uh, clear description that will you know, go forward to the legislature to, to, to actually craft the legislation. And, and I think it, when we get the actual bill language back, this will be an area we're spending a lot of time looking at to make sure we've got it right. Uh, I think that's safe to say. That's right. And I, I would also just say that OSU has been working with a, a wide array of uh, individuals, researchers, uh, forest research uh, directors, um, research forest directors, excuse me, um, uh, 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 you know, various stakeholders and, um, and getting input on uh, exactly um, you know, what that 
uh, that structure, what the constraints of that structure might be on the forest management, and uh, are, uh, is there you know too much restriction to facilitate to be able to uh, accomplish the research objectives, the management objectives, or is it the appropriate level? And so that we're getting really excellent input and feedback from a wide array of people, and um, uh, some um, uh, and specifically a sort of an advisory board of research forest directors from uh, universities, uh, uh, NGO, and agencies uh, representation. Great. And I'm sure we can have more questions on that um, if folks are interested in digging into it. Um, the last bullet on the, on the the under the board of directors talks about submittal of a biennial programmatic review and annual operations performance reports for the first six years to the state land board. And I'm just going to call that out because I want to that I want to talk about that in a minute when we get to the state land board role. Um, and I think that's um, that's that's the relationship between the board of directors and the entity and going up and the board of directors and the and the the executive director looking at the implementation of the mission. Composition of the board of directors has received a lot of discussion. <clears throat> um, currently, the, the the draft legislative concept anticipates um, the um, appointment of the board happening by the state land board um, through direct non-Senate confirmation appointments. Um, and rather than um, specific, have a specific um, interest-based board where there's a seat attached to a particular interest or perspective, and, and, and having that um, be the basis for forming the board. Um, the advisory committee working group um, chewed on it quite a bit and ultimately, at least um, for now, has decided that what they would like is what the second bullet identifies. And this would be the direction to the land board to guide the appointment of, of, of future board members. Um, consult with the board of directors that exists and Oregon State University and then seek to appoint members that have um, a broad um, a broad basis of interest, um, a, a balance of interests and expertise and experience related to the purposes and the operations of the Elliott State Research Forest, as well as a demonstrable interest in the success of the state admission of the forest. So you can see it's some strong language, but broad language to guide the, the appointment of future board members by the state land board. Composition um, seven to nine. Um, I think the legislation will probably be seven or nine members, not an even number. Um, but um, and then the dean of the College of Forestry is the only designated continuing member that's set out in the legislation, um, but is also established as a non-voting ex officio member of the board. And then um, there was some discussion about how we transition to this new full board, and um, I think that. The, um, the, the, the intent anyway in the current legislative concept is that um, we'll have a transition from the current DSL advisory committee membership to a board of directors with staggered terms to allow um, permanent board members to be appointed over time to have continuity or sense of continuity between the current advisory committee and what comes next. And then the um, state land board role really um, is not in a decision making um, position under the current legislative concept. They will every two years, um, well, for the first six years, have an annual report um, provided by the board of directors and then a legislatively mandated um, programmatic review that would occur every two years at a meeting, a public meeting of the state land board um, where the board of directors will um, provide their biennial report, there'll be a presentation opportunity for the land board to hear that in public, um, hear from OSU, hear from the public, um, and provide feedback on, on how, th how the land board perceives things to be going. Um, and, um, and then there are um, some specific, three specific things that require the land board to actually act um, and approve before they can happen, and you can see those on the screen. 
Otherwise, the land board's role is more to step back and provide mission-related policy guidance to the board of directors and, and act as the North Star. And if things are getting a little rough, um, give some good feedback and, and uh, be an opportunity for the public to, to talk directly to the land board about how the public feels things are going as well. Last slide, um, discussion about public accountability. This new entity will be subject to open meetings laws, public records laws. There will be a third party right of action in Oregon state courts um, to challenge um, some specific um, decisions that are articulated in the statute. And um, what is here is about as far as the working group has gone with this so far. There may be some modifications to this and it may look a little different um, when the working group and the advisory committee is finished working on their recommendations um, with DSL and OSU, but this is where we are today. And you can see it really is if we are managing, if the forest management plan is inconsistent with the proposal that the land board started out with, or if the operation plans are inconsistent with the forest management plan, it kind of tears off of these documents, which is the importance that Shannon was trying to attach to the process for developing the forest management plan that's getting started right now. That is a very important key document for implementing the forest going forward and also to provide the, the accountability 10 years down the road or five years down the road about whether the operation of the forest is proceeding as folks agreed to at the time we formed the, the new entity. So Ali, that's all I've got to say. That was too much, but um, I'll um, step back and I'll go to whatever slides you tell me to go to. I would argue that it's just enough, Jeff. Um, we've, got a, we've got a couple of questions in the chat already um, that I think we'll go to first. The first one is from Dana Kay, who's asking about funding. Would the legislation that creates the independent agency also come with funds to run the independent independent agency or forest management? So um, that's, a, that's a great question. The, we expect that the, um, the legislation creating the new entity will also address um, decoupling, um, the decoupling of the entity from the common school fund. Um, there is um, also, we're anticipating um, a time, a lag between um, 2022 and when the um, habitat conservation plan is in place and baseline monitoring that's contemplated by the university has been undertaken and, and actual uh, operations of the forest will begin. So there's a startup time that we will um, be funding. I, don't, I can't tell you tonight the source of the funds for that startup funding. Um, we've got several, several um, pathways we're pursuing simultaneously. To, um, to kind of define the, the amount of that money and the source of those funds. Um, but once the forest is up and operating, um, I think everybody from the inception of this process has been um, accepted that it will be financially self-supporting and not require um, um, a budget be adopted by the legislature on a biennial basis as you're used to seeing with other agencies. So this, um, the, the whole goal here is the forest will um, financially support itself and the research programs and um, decoupling it from the common school fund is a key first step toward that happening. Thanks, Jeff. We've got one more question in the chat and then Fergus, I see your hand up and I'll come to you after that. This chat question is from Diana P um, about the HCP. She's wondering if the comments that were submitted when the plan was first presented, um, will those be provided to the feds reviewing it in the NEPA process? I think I know the answer to this, um, Jeff, but I'm going to let you say it because I don't want to get anything wrong. <laughs> um, I had not actually thought about how that, how the mechanistically that might occur, um, but we should be making sure that they see that um, and mm -hmm. so they don't have to be submitted by the commenter twice. So um, Allie and I have not talked about this, but I don't, I, I don't see why we shouldn't be able to make those accessible to the federal agencies um, by submitting them as part of the public comment period. Um, yeah, 
my on the my on the fly thought my on the fly thought on that is like yes we should find a find a way to get that information to the federal agencies but also make sure that the public knows that we did like the purpose of that initial um, comment period on the working draft was so that we could refine the draft before we submitted it so and that uh, and we did and so I think it's important for folks to to know that we'll submit what they said then but that the the, the administrative draft that the feds have now and the draft that goes out for public comment um, you should certainly review that and make comment on that as well because it has things have changed yeah I think the important message is while we would while we can translate or transmit those what we received onto the federal government it won't you, you need to be responsible for submitting your own comments on the administrative draft that's in front of the federal agency in that process because the two things might not necessarily line up um, otherwise. Perfect. Okay, Fergus, you are up. Okay, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Fergus. Okay, thanks. Good to see ya. Well, Jeff, congratulations. You certainly Got plenty of chutzpah, got to say that. <laughs> I'm the, just uh, doing my job taking direction from others, man. OK. Um, we know uh, we were happy to see uh, Lori Swanson and Jerry Franklin leading a panel on forest carbon at, in Glasgow. Bev Law was there, too, yeah. in your uh, approach to uh, getting advice on this work. Uh, too bad you didn't consult them, or at least listen to what they said. I know Lori is talking about a conservation easement. Jerry said, this is a research proposal that lacks scientific merit and integrity. And Bev feels like OSU has bailed on forest carbon. So I guess you went far afield to find people who uh, incredible and support you. But the idea that you are standing up a corporation with permanent membership, with no oversight, is the worst in Oregon state management. That's why John Kitzhaber said the state was ungovernable because of these silos on natural resources. Uh, very unfortunate. There's no reason to move this agency outside of DSL except to avoid scrutiny. And I, I really, Shannon, I have to caution you about calling this ecological forestry when you've integrated herbicides in it. There's no place for herbicides in, in ecological forestry. I just hope there's somebody in the legislature that is gonna be looking out for the people of Oregon when this comes across their plate, because I'm afraid you guys have let us down. Thanks for the chance to talk. No, I appreciate it, Ferguson. Maybe um, I'll, I'll let OSU respond to the things if they if they want to. Um, but I'll take on your first your first comment, which you said corporation um, is what we're standing up. Um, actually, we made the explicit decision not to create a public corporation, but rather to um, create a an, a public body that is the same as any public agency with the same accountability that the Department of State Lands has with open meetings laws, the Administrative Procedure Act, Department of Justice being the, the, the legal advisor on, on things and, and the operation of it. Um, so I think, uh, I, 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 wanna, I know there was discussion that you witnessed because you've been sticking with this process from the beginning around a, uh, creating a public corporation because there were some benefits to it, but we thought the negatives outweighed the positives on that and decided not to do that. Um, so 
um, you could expect the same level of accountability and oversight um, with this entity that you would um, that you have with other state agencies. Shannon, why don't you start off in responding to Fergus and, and I can jump in uh, as needed. Sure, happy to. Um, so Fergus, I, I appreciate your comments. Um, to the, the ecological forestry piece, um, with our uh, plans for the extensive areas, we are going to be working on outlining um, the the treatments and suite of prescription options in the management plan so that's not something that we've um we've detailed yet and so we're that is something that we are focusing on now in this uh in this coming year um and looking at the the full suite of practices in uh in complex silviculture and ecological forestry um that would support the research goals of the forest and um and i would be happy to talk with you further about the details of that as we continue in this process. I would just I would just add as well that the notion is to be able to contrast the uh, the intensive management as is practiced in Western Oregon with the alternative forest practices. And so the, the science requires to have comparisons that are meaningful, that bring those treatments to the fore and do so in a way that, you know, helps provide the very data that, you know, is needed to be able to characterize differences between practices between intensive and extensive. So if herbicides are used in intensive practices and we didn't use herbicides in intensive practice as a um, contrast to what's being done in the, old, the extensive, we would be criticized for not having used that practice, if that makes sense. And that, that so, and as Shannon said, the actual details on the you know, what treatments will be, what the actual um, components of individual treatments will be, and the specific prescriptions of those treatments will come forth in the management planning process. And we'll, um, you know, look forward to your input again as we move forward on the management planning process. So thanks, Fergus. Hey, um, I've got one thing left on Fergus's list that I didn't address that I want to touch on. <clears throat> I think Fergus, you, um, your comments um, lead me to um, think that you're assuming that there won't be a conservation easement on any portion of the Elliott State Research Forest going forward, and that that is not something that um, I think is accurate. Um, what we've been saying is that. Um, we've got a, we've got, a, we had to get the HCP in place. We had to get the management regime um, worked out on this, and and we want to um, look at the conservation easement in the context of the de, the final decoupling from the common school fund. And there are a number of different revenue sources for that, um, and some of them may include um, um, having conservation easement over a portion of the forest in exchange for uh, a funding stream. Um, some may be, uh, there may be the potential to enroll in a carbon market, um, and those decisions all have to be um, sequenced appropriately um, in order to make sure that at the end of the day, when we place a um, whatever um, protection and assurance of, of conservation benefits that are expected as part of the state funding for decoupling, that the, that that assurance occurs in the context of the funding streams that we're using to to be able to decouple in the first place. So there will be a um, a woven um, interrelated package of protections across the forest. Um, it's just premature to say there's a a one and done way to do that um, at this point. 
Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm seeing the, the conversation that's happening in the chat and the questions about funding, but Fergus, I just wanted to double check that you didn't have a follow-up because your hand's still your hands still up. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tom, I was talking about the extensive uh, thinning that you're calling ecological forestry, not the intensive. I, I hold that, I was just looking at Jerry Franklin's book, there's no, there's no herbicides in there. If, if you need herbicides, you're blowing it and you have no right to call it ecological forestry. And you should know that, sorry. No, that's fine, Fergus. I, uh, I will, I mean, uh, I don't know if Katie is still on, but I don't recall that we explicitly said we were using uh, her herbicides in the extents of it left the op option open under, uh, you know, that didn't specifically say that herbicides will be used. It left the option open for herbicides to be used. Yeah, and you're you right. An option open and you're gonna have a permanent untouchable board. How, how is this board gonna be corrected? What if somebody goes crazy? How are you gonna get somebody off this board? There's no mechanism for that, it appears to me. So Fergus, there is a direct connection to the land board and the board of directors is answerable to the state land board. Um, yeah, once every other year with no legislative, with no power in a consultative capacity. No, not, not on appointments and, and not, not with um, specific actions that the board might take. But if there's a, um, it's the same as occurs in the Board of Forestry or the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board or the Water Resources Commission or the Fish and Wildlife Commission, they're all appointed. Oh and, yeah, which one of those and, has permanent members, Jeff? We don't. These this board won't have permanent members. And, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. What's, no. What are the terms of the board of the board of directors? Um, I don't think I. I believe we've been talking at three to four years, but it's not been. It, it hasn't been decided what to propose in the um, in the legislation. So I didn't put it on the slide. You um, misspoke then, because you spoke of of a permanent membership. Your temporary membership leading to oh, permanent membership. I, I well, then I, I, I apologize. What I was trying to say is that we would have a transition of an interim board that was comprised of members of the advisory committee that would be staggered in their terms, leading to a permanent board of directors that will have members that will rotate on on terms, and that's the most that's the more accurate way to put it. Thanks, Jeff. I'll sleep better tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would. I, I understand why you were you were lathered up there. I I would be too if it was a permanent board. Hey, <laughs> glad, we, glad you cleared that up. Oh, Katie, is that you? Yeah, that's me. Sorry. I just wanted okay. to chime in and answer the the question about herbicides on the extensive. I think the wording in the proposal is herbicides will be used only if regeneration is not being obtained. And so that's, it's more of a, a last resort. And that is to make sure that um, if we're not getting regeneration, then we would consider using it, but it's not used as a standard practice in the extensive treatments. And so I would, um, I, don't, I can't think of anyone who would really want to think about ecological forestry and not be assured that we're regenerating if we're removing trees. So, so that's the, Maybe you should put in some language that if one of your prescriptions requires herbicides, that you should change your prescriptions. Well, or at least a commitment not to use herbicides, if at all possible, because that language gives you way too much wiggle room. Well, we're, we're, we're working it out, Fergus, and um, I want to give the future the wiggle room that they need. And so I will you know, happy to continue to find ways that we don't have to use them and ways that do work in very shrubby systems. And, um, and if it works, great, we'll do that and we won't need to use them. And, but I'm not gonna lock, lock it in at this point for the future. I think people need some, to make some operational decisions in the future that I'm not willing to cut off today. I, I do appreciate you've, lowered the age of the extensive treatment. That's 
appropriate. And I thanks for that. Lowered the age. I'm so, oh, I'm not sure what you mean, but um, we've increased. Well, you're, the you were going to cut up to 150 year old trees. In the oh age. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we 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 are really interested in having treatments that work and primarily most of our extensive is in stands that are actually under 65. And so- um, I think language says all of them are under 65. Not extensive, no. No? That's intensive, that's intensive. What are the ages in the extensive? I think we the, the maximum age um, is, oh, uh, what did we say? It, well, we, we made a commitment not to cut anything that was not initially established from the 1868 fire, anything that predated the 1868 fire. Oh, so you're we, still talking about cutting 150 year old trees in this and then re regenerating with herbicides. That's real. Well, Fergus, that, that's one way you could put it, but that's not the reality. So um, we, we can talk about that, but I think you need to look at the whole, the whole thing and not just the small, the smaller parts, Maybe but for, so Fergus, Fergus, Katie, I'm course. sorry. Hey, I hate to interrupt. I hate to interrupt. Um, it's my least favorite thing to do, but um, we do have a number of questions on different topics that are coming up in the chat and other folks with their hands raised. So um, I, it would be great if we could continue this conversation. Um, as I know, Fergus, you certainly will um, uh, offline or we, if we've got time to come back to it. Um, so thank you. Thank you both. Um, appreciate the, the dialogue there. Um, I do want to want to take the time to answer uh, some of the questions about funding. Um, we've, we've got a number of questions about forest funding, um, funding the ongoing operations in the chat. Um, I think folks are interested in sort of what the funding streams are going to look like as well as um, why why um, it's the expectation that the forest will be self-sustaining um, in the future since it's not currently self-sustaining now. Um, so Jeff, um, I see you nodding, yeah. so I'm gonna go to you. Just, um, just real quick, I, I, um, we, we know this is an issue that, that a number of folks are really interested in digging into um, more than, um, it, we dug into it a lot in 2019 with the advisory committee um, and then in the last year um, of COVID, it's, it's not been front and center. Um, we're putting it front and center again um, at the, the December 15th advisory committee meeting. So there'd be a substantial presentation at that meeting with a follow-up um, of, a, of a, a two hour public drop-in session, just like this one, that's just focused on the financial pieces. Um, and that that was, I don't know if that's been scheduled yet, but it should be before Christmas. I think some tentative dates are being floated right now. So I don't want to spend a bunch of time on the financial piece when this when that's coming up and this is more about the legislation. But the, the short answer to John, um, your, your chat question about why should it be financially viable now when it wasn't um, on the Common School Fund, two reasons. One is um, if it is decoupled, there's no longer the return that's required to the com as an asset of the common school fund. So the forest will have a financial obligation to managing to whatever it costs to manage the forest itself as, an, as a research forest. And secondly, and probably more importantly, is this HCP. Um, the HCP is a predicate for um, understanding exactly what, how the forest can be operated within the confines of the Endangered Species Act and provide the species protection that the Federal um, Endangered Species Act requires. Um, and, and the constraints on harvesting will be really clearly, are clearly mapped out in that HCP in relationship to mirrorlets, owls, and salmon requirements. Um, and so there's some certainty that comes from the incidental take permit that's associated with a habitat conservation plan. So those two pieces combined create a much different financial outlook for the forest than existed back in 2010, 2012, 2014, when um, things were very heated around how to manage it as an asset in the confines of take avoidance under the Endangered Species Act. So stay tuned. Um, 
December 15th and a follow-up um, specifically for public discussion and, and um, questions and answers on ins and outs of the financial plan for the research forest. And I know OSU's working hard on it. All right, thanks, Jeff. Francis, you have been waiting very patiently and it is your turn. So go right ahead. Oh, hi, thanks. Say, I have a quick comment to make on the herbicide issue. And then I have a question on the legislation. So on the herbicide issue, I would just like to remind uh, DSL that the adjacent uh, Coos Bay BLM lands do not use any herbicides for commodity production on any of the region harvest. Uh, they haven't in a number of years. They only use herbicides for noxious weeds on roadsides. And so uh, it would be, if you have to use herbicides it, immediately adjacent to the BLM lands that do not use herbicides, especially on the east side of the Elliott where you're adjacent to those uh, MITA BLM lands where they do do the region harvest. You know, I mean, you could look at the difference between what you're doing and what the BLM is doing. So I just want to point out that that BLM does not use herbicides at all. They aren't allowed to by the resource management plan. It's a great comment. Now on yeah, the, the nodding is good too. <laughs> now on the legislation, um, the the question I have, when you had up your maps uh, of what was going to go to legislation, I understand that we're talking about all the uh, common school fund lands in the Elliott, but not the Board of Forestry lands in the Elliott that is uh, going to have legislation and a forest management plan. The rest is going to go under that other forest management plan. So. My question is, what about this parcel of land known as East Hackey? And so that's, I think, 600 plus acres in the northwest corner of the Elliott. That's common school fund lands. And um, why isn't that being included in the current maps that you're showing us about what you're going to legislate about? East Hackey should be in there, right? It's common school fund lands. It's not Board of Forestry lands. East Hackey, um, East Hackey Ridge is about, for those that don't know, is about 700 and some, 700 and some acres on borders. Um, I think the northwest side um, of the forest, um, immediately adjacent to what we've been talking about is the Elliott State Research Forest. Um, Francis, I don't have an answer for you today on what the future is for East Hackey Ridge. Um, um, it was not included at the when this process started, um, in part because of the um, the lawsuit. The 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 land board had sold those parcels, and that's what that's what led to the the Cascadia uh, decision by the by the Oregon Supreme Court. And so um, they are not included in the the mapping of the research forest, the 83,000 acres, some acres um, that you see, um, that doesn't mean that they might not be at the end of the day um, or that they might not be moved in over time. Um, it just, and, and I put up the state land board oversight slide again, because specifically one of the things that we're, um, we're talking about is the capacity to expand the size of the Elliott in the future. And that would be something that the board of directors could vote to do and the land board could would have to approve that if there were any property expansions or swaps. Um, so we're working, we're, we're talking about East Hackey Ridge, but we haven't reached a, a, a final place. Um, there are just enough moving pieces um, I can tell you it's included both in the um, it, it's included in the coverage of the of the habitat conservation plan administrative draft. Um, and it's also included in the coverage of the 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 west west side forest lands HCP that that Department of Forestry um, is it has pending at this point as well. So we've tried to cover our basis and give us flexibility for moving forward. 
with that and the inholding that you write. Okay, well, with. yeah, East Hackey has been back in the hands of the state for a, a long time, long enough for it to be included with the rest of the common school fund lands on the Elliott. So I would encourage you to not include it with the Board of Forestry lands. It really doesn't belong in that other HCP forest management plan. It belongs in the Elliott Research Forest with the other common school fund yeah. lands. So I understand. And 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 I guess the last thing I can say is that um, and we said we talked about this at an advisory committee meeting you may have heard we we are updating the appraisal for the Elliott Forest and as part of that update we are um, we are having the um, East Hackey Ridge portion appraised as well as the rest of the forest so that we have that we have what the additional value would be as a common school fund asset in a current appraisal when that's done. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Francis. Um, do we have, I am not seeing any more hands up. Does anybody have any more questions about the legislation or anything else that we've talked about this evening? Feel free to, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Diana. Go right ahead. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Um, basically, uh, so when this goes to legislation, you said for the February time when the legislators are meeting, do we need to call our legislators and say, hey, vote yes, or anything like that? You know, I think my advice to you on that is that um, there are a number of different interest groups and interests represented on the on the advisory committee that have been working on this for three years. And so um, coordinating with one of the representatives that reflects your perspective on the Elliot is a great way to kind of get um, get direction on on when it would be best to, to um, express your voice and to whom and how. Um, so um, we, can, we can give you a list of the, of the, I think it's posted actually, Ali, isn't it? Who's on the advisory committee and the groups that they represent? It is. I, I also and, wanna know, were you done, Jeff? I, I was just gonna say, and we're happy to talk more with you about it as we get closer into January. Um, because I, I think right now there is no legislation and the, and the session isn't, you know, isn't even, we, we don't even know the pathway of, of how a bill will be introduced or where it'll go. So this is one of those times where I think patience until January is probably the best thing. And then coordinating with the advisory committee membership is, is a great way to, to help. And we'll be, again, talking a lot more about this in December and January. Yeah, and I also wanted to note that we are already planning to do another info session at the end of January before um, session starts, because by then we'll be able to sort of walk you through, you know, where we started with the, the legislative concept and the ideas for what the legislation needed to include. And um, at that point, we should have something that is very, very close to becoming a bill. Um, and so we're planning to just sort of present where we're at at that point, and then also talk about what the legislative process looks like. Um, so folks so folks know what the opportunities there um, to get involved as part of that public process um, the legislature has. As Peggy's noting in the chat, the legislature does have a public process for the legislation too. So thank you for that um, terrific question. Okay, any final questions? Any final questions or thoughts? Janae is asking about what committee, about committees, um, committee will hear the legislation. We don't know. Um, in we the don't. chat. We, we, we not only do we not know the committee, we don't know the chamber um, at this point and, and won't really until we have a bill. Um, and so I think again, January is probably our best bet for having some real clarity on that. Um, I do want to um, I, I do want to respond to one thing that's in the chat box, um, and it's um, from Angus McLean. Um, 
it, an interpretation in the chat box was that the court decision of the Oregon Supreme Court that enjoined the sale of the portion of the forest to Seneca, which is the East Hackey Ridge portion, um, concluded in some way or another that there was no obligation for the Elliott to be a continuing asset of the common school fund and therefore not any cost to decoupling it as an asset. And um, I, I guess my, I just wanna be clear since that was out to everybody that that is not the conclusion of the Department of Justice. Um, and um, the, the predicate for this entire conversation around the decoupling of the forest to become a research forest is that it will require a $221 million payment to the Common School Fund to, to accomplish the goal of managing the forest as a public forest for a variety of values that are different than generating revenue for the fund as an asset. And 100 million of that's been allocated so far. So there's 121 million that's still on the table um, based on the legal advice and the interpretation of the Supreme Court decision. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Fergus, I see your hand up. We've got about five minutes left. So I'll ask you to be quick because I want to make sure I have time to do a little recap of what we've got coming up for meetings. So go right ahead. Um, yeah, Jeff, I'd like to see that opinion. Um, I don't think that's at all clear. Uh, it's but, the, but it's I, the Oregon I, Supreme Court decision in the Cascadia Wildlands versus the State Land Board. Yeah. Yeah, and what it says is that it's up to the legislature to determine what happens in the Elliott, period. And the legislature can do whatever they want. I, yeah, I'm, I'd like to see that opinion because I certainly disagree, but I just like to go on record. Katie, if you're cutting 80% of 150 year old stands and then using herbicides to regenerate and calling that ecological forestry, you have no business running the LA Forest. Right. Thank, thank you, Fergus. Hang, who's, well, who's jumping in there? I'll, I'll, I'll start off okay. and, and Katie can give details. Fergus, there's no intent to harvest 80% of 150 year old trees. You just have the, the numbers completely wrong. The vast, vast majority of mature stands go into reserves. A small, small portion goes into extensive. The vast majority of extensive is actually in 65-year-old stands, not in mature 150-year-old stands. And of the, the mature stands, a small portion is indicated to be uh, treated at 80% retention, not 80% cutting. And it doesn't specify which trees will be cut during that. It simply says 80% retention. So I, there's a misunderstanding of the intent of those extensive treatments. And Katie, I would, if you're still available, I'd ask you to, to step in with anything that, I, that you would like to add. Maybe Katie stepped away from her computer. No, no, I'm here. No, that's fine, Tom. I think you covered it well. Okay. So. so, Fergus, I hope that clears it up. There's no intent. No, it does not clear it up, Tom, because you, the, the extensive prescription is for 20 to 80% on various oh, stands, so and it includes stands up to 150 years old. It's in your plan. No, only, only in those mature stands, the limited mature stands that are slated for any treatment would be 80% retention stands. You've misread the document and I okay. encourage you to go okay. back and read again. I'm corrected, thank you. Okay, thank you, Fergus. Thank you, thank you both. Um, we, have about, we have about two minutes left. Um, my small person wants to go outside and see the moon. So um, that's what I'm gonna be doing in about two minutes. Um, I first wanted to, before I do that, um, I just wanted to, uh, remind everybody of what we've got coming up. Um, so the advisory committee's force management planning work group is meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. The next advisory committee meeting is Wednesday, December 15th, also at 9 a.m. Um, the legislative concept work group is continuing to meet on Fridays, not this Friday. We continue to host uh, legislative concept drop-ins on Tuesdays, but not this Tuesday. 
um, when those meetings are back up and going, um, we'll, we'll post it on the website. Um, and the other thing that we are going to keep you all informed about is we're expecting another public session of some kind, um, I think, in the next uh, mid-December timeframe, um, specifically related to the financial piece. So keep an eye out for that. And then we're expecting another public um, session uh, before the legislative session starts about the legislative concept and the bill. Um, team, did I miss anything that we've got coming up? There sure, nope. Okay, there sure is a lot going on. Um, one last plug, the Elliot, uh, our Elliot mailing list is how you and others who are interested in this can, can stay informed. So I would encourage everybody to sign up for that. Um, and with that, um, that is our time this evening. So thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful night and we will see you again real soon. Thanks, Bye Ellie. everybody. Bye-bye.